Hello again. Uh, today we're going to continue our discussion of Hardy-Weinberg and how this relates to both genetics and evolution. And we're going to focus on some of the Hardy-Weinberg assumptions. So to do this, we're going to start off talking about this snail, Litorina saxitalis, which can live in the tidal zones on, on the rocks uh, you know, around, around different parts of the ocean. Um, and some of the snails can live in a high, or the snails can live from a high tide to mid tide to low tide zone. And what we can see, a scientist can go out and look, and they've seen that there is a different proportion of alleles at high tide versus mid tide versus low tide. Now the allele that we're gonna concentrate on is this allele that we're gonna refer to as um, the amino transferase enzyme gene, okay? And there are two different alleles for this gene. There's a 120 allele and a 100. You don't need to worry about the details of this. We're gonna simplify this. All you need to know is that there are these two different alleles at this point. And we're gonna simplify it so that we're gonna say, okay, the 120 allele is the yellow bead and the 100 allele is the white bead so that we can kind of watch simulations of what happens over time when and and track what happens to the allele frequency over time. So when we go out there right now we can see that at the high tide zone there's 90% yellow, 10% white and that's represented by these four cups. So those are four samples from from this high tide zone area. The mid tide tide zone area is represented by these four cups which have about 85% yellow and 15% white. And then the low tide zone area is represented by these four cups, these four pot samples from that, from that part of the population, which have about 10% yellow and about 90% white. So what we're gonna uh, watch is what happens when things occurs to this population and we're gonna track the allele frequency through time. So let's assume that in 1988, um, well, we don't have to assume this. This is something that really happened. There was this toxic algae. So there was this algae in the water, and it affected, for the most part, the low zone snails. The higher, the mid zone and the high zone snails were out of the water long enough that this toxic algae didn't really affect them. So it mostly affected only the low zone snails. And there was this huge reduction in population size where you went, remember, from these cups being almost full down to um, very few individuals per cup. And this caused, um, you know, it, it didn't matter whether you had a, more uh, yellow alleles or white alleles, this toxic algae killed indifferentially. So it didn't matter. Everyone was, most, most of the snails were dying off. And so you lost, you know, more than 90% of the entire population was lost. And so what was left were these kind of random samples of the original population. So what we're going to do then is look at the allele frequency and how it changed through time and describe why it's changing in different ways. So to do this, we're going to talk about a phenomenon in biology that's actually a phenomena from statistics. It's called genetic drift. This is where you have a change in the gene pool of a small population due to chance. When I say gene pool, what we really mean is the number of alleles of the different kinds of alleles. So, you know, remember that we started off with this low tide population having 10% yellow and 90% white, but after this, this toxic algae came through, there was a great reduction where we were left with these numbers of alleles in the population. So essentially, two of the samples still had this 10% yellow, 90% white distribution. But this sample now has 40% yellow and 60% white, and this sample had 20% yellow and 80% uh, white. So there was a change in allele frequency from this generation to this generation, at least in some of the samples, right? And, and what, what caused that change? Well, the only thing that caused the change was this random sampling error. The fact that when you randomly sample and when you subsample a population, especially down to a very small number, just due to random chance, there's a, there's a, prob there, there's a chance that the new pr um, proportion of alleles is going to be different than the original population. There's also a chance it could be exactly the same as were the, the two on the top, but there's a chance that it could be different as well. 
Um, and this is what we call genetic drift. So it has nothing to do with natural selection. It's simply just a random sampling error phenomena that is occurring. Okay, so let's talk about then genetic drift, but in terms of the two main types of genetic drift that we see. The first one is called the bottleneck effect. And this results from a drastic reduction in population size. So this is the example that we just went over with the algal, the toxic algal, algae that came in and killed most of the low level um, snails. And here's another example, I just want to point this out. It's called the bottleneck because you always go from a, an original population that is larger and then it goes through some event where only a few individuals make it through the event and it doesn't have anything to do with what they are. There's no natural selection that's deciding who makes it through the bottleneck. It's simply just this random chance event, who makes it through, they survive. And in this case you can see that we went from a population that seemed to be mostly you know, about the same number of whites and blues and then a few yellows sprinkled to a population that has many more blues than white and no yellows. And this is important about genetic drift. Genetic drift reduces genetic diversity over time. It gradually reduces genetic diversity. An example of this is cheetahs. Cheetahs went through a bottleneck uh, many years ago. And we know this because we can go out and look at all of the cheetahs all over the world and in the zoos, and they're all basically genetically identical. And the best explanation for that is that they went through this genetic drift um, event. They went through this bottleneck event where their population was reduced, we think, to maybe less than 500 individuals potentially. The second type of genetic drift is called founder effect. This is where a few individuals from a large population leave that population and found a new population. A good example of this are the Amish in Pennsylvania who left, I think, Holland and they came over here to the United States, founded this colony, and it was just a few individuals. And it so happened that a few of those individuals brought with them this allele for polydactyly that we've talked about before. And, and so you see in the Amish of Pennsylvania who don't, they don't interbreed with individuals essentially from um, other populations, so they're, they're kind of isolated in a sense, they have a much higher incidence of polydactyly than any other populations in the world. How do we explain this? Well, it's because a few of those individuals that came here happen to have that allele, and so now that entire population has that allele in a little bit higher, in, um, in a little bit higher uh, frequency than other populations of humans.